Samantha from Jessie May Tutorials here and today I'm going to show you how to create faux spiderweb jasper. So here is a pebble that I have that is actual spiderweb jasper and this is what we are going to be trying to imitate today. So you can see how nice that one is. Now I'm also later on going to be doing another uh, similar version to the stone. It can also be called spiderweb jasper but another name for it is net jasper. So I will be doing another tutorial on that stone and it will be very similar. So you can look forward to that one. So anyway, you'll want to have mixed up your white and I provided a colour recipe for that. And you can see it's kind of a dirty white colour. You'll have rolled it into a log so now, that we, so now we can chop pieces off. And just go with a blade. And start chopping. And now what I'm going to do is now that I've got it chopped just a little bit, I'm going to bring over some black mica powder. And now I do stock this on my shop, Jessima Design, so if you're interested in having a look at that, um, I will provide a link in the description. You can see here. Some black marker powder. Uh, black pastel will also work if you happen to have that. And I'm just putting down quite a bit and this is going to form the veins and it's also going to act as a release agent to keep these pieces from sticking together while we continue to chop. So I'll just pick those up and I'll mix them around in this a little bit. Okay, and I'm going to continue to chop. So if you had a look at this stone that I showed earlier, you'll see that some areas have coarser pieces, while others have finer pieces. So I'm going to crop it to maybe a medium sized chip, like that. Then I'm going to take a small amount of that, put that off to the side. And you'll leave that just the way it is. And then you'll take the rest and you'll keep chopping this fine so that you're going to get a range of different shapes. And the nice thing about this mica powder is it's keeping it completely separate from each other so we don't have to worry about pieces getting all stuck, things like that. Okay, I'll take another section of that and put it over in the same area. There we go. Now I'll take these and I'll really, really, really chop these fine. These have to be as fine as I can possibly get them. These are really, really fine. There we are. We're basically there. We're basically there. Okay. Just quickly knock them off my blade. Bring over the rest that we had sitting over here. And we'll kind of mix those all together get that powder all over the pieces so that we've got a nice cover okay there we go now what I want to do is I just want to look quite happy with it and now let's see we want to see if we they are pretty sharp um, but they're not quite, the p individual pieces aren't quite as sharp as what I have here. So you'll just take it now that we have the mica powder on and we'll actually just roll it gently in our hands. And what that's going to do is it's going to just lightly dull those edges. I'm 
not pressing very hard, I'm just gently rolling and that powder's keeping them all separate and that's just dulling down some of those edges. There you go. See my hands are a complete mess, I'm going to have to clean them up in a little while. But not before we put some paint on. So I'm just going to take some basic um, black paint and it's just any, any brand will work. There we go. I don't want to put too much on and now I'm just going to use a skewer to mix this around and a piercing pin so that I'm not getting my hands involved too much. Now you don't want to add too much paint to make this all soggy but you want to add enough, enough that's going to coat it because the powder has acted as a helper up until now but because it's um, got non-stick properties, you want to kind of get rid of that. So by adding the paint, you're basically putting another cover over the, over the powder. And so once this paint dries, the pieces will stick together much easier. So that's quite important. You must add the paint, otherwise you're going to have quite a bit of trouble later on sticking these pieces back together. And now I'm not squishing the pieces, I'm just gently rolling them around, getting all that paint into all the nooks and crannies. And then when you're done, gently pat it down so that you don't have too high a stack. All the pieces are basically just sitting off from each other. And I'll just pop the skewer off to the side. And now you can use a hairdryer or a heat gun. You if you're a patient person, you can just leave this to dry. But I'm going to use a heat gun on my lowest heat setting. You can also use a hair dryer and on a low wind speed and this will dry the paint quite quickly. There we are. And then while the top has dried, you will need to mix it around again to get the wet parts exposed again because only the top parts that are showing will dry and so you'll just need to mix it around while you're using your heat gun. Okay so I've cleaned up the tile and I've got these sitting over here on a separate tile. You can see they're all nice and dry. So now what we want to do is we want to create some filler for here. So you can see that we have some um, quite large black areas in the stone. So I've decided the best way to do that, I don't want to use clay because it needs to sit in like larger veins. So the best way to do that is to take some paint and I'm just, I'm almost out of this one. There we go. Take some paint and I'll just use my skewer to do this and I'm going to spread it around on the tile so that it forms almost like a skin. Nice thin skin. And this is where working on a ceramic tile is super helpful because you don't have to worry about it being messy or anything because it can just get wiped off really easily. Alright, that's thin enough. Then you'll bring over your hairdryer or your heat gun again. And this time you can set it onto the hottest setting you want because there's no clay to cure. So just set it on and watch it dry. There we are. That took maybe a minute or so to dry. It's much quicker than waiting for it to dry. So now you'll bring over your tissue blade. And you just start scraping along your tile, and this will pick up your paint. And it's not going to come up in one nice big, big um, uh, sheet. It's going to come up in these um, tiny little pieces, which is just what we want.
Just trying to pick up as much of this as I can. There we are. Okay, now this is pretty hot at the moment, so I don't want to be putting my uh, polymer clay pieces on it right now. So what I'm going to do is I've got this tile over here so you can see what I'm doing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use two tissue blades to pick that up and I'm just going to chuck it in there. Okay, Pop that aside for a minute, clean up this tile. Okay, so that's not too hot. So I'm going to bring these back over. And we're going to mix them around. Get all of that paint that we scraped in all in there and mixed up together. Okay. So now what you can do is you can form this into a cane and then you can take slices or you can turn it into cabochons and that is what I'm going to do right now. So let me just pop these off over here and we'll bring over the cabochon moulds. Okay, and the first one I'm going to start with is this one that I got from eBay. And I'm just going to grab a fair amount of those. I'm going to press this in. Okay. Now I'm kind of deciding what I want where. Because you can decide to add in some small pieces or large pieces. It's completely up to you. So I have some large pieces in there. Now I'm busy adding in some small ones. And now the thing with this is you're going to have to do a bit of sanding afterwards because you're going to have to sand off all the paint and grime and stuff after it is baked. So if you're going to do a cane you won't have to do that but this does give a more natural effect especially on the back because if you don't put a backing in um, which will save you clay but if you want an overall cabochon or pendant that looks real it's best to just fill it all in with this so that your back, your sides and your front will have the same sort of pattern to them. Okay, I filled that in. Now I'm just going to give it a gentle roll. You can see that's fine. Now I'll bring over my flexible tissue blade. How gently Run it along the back here just to get rid of any raised bits so that's nice and even. And there you can see how it looks so far. I'm really happy with how that looks so far. Okay, we got just a little bit over there. And that can get sanded off later. That was just to even up the back. Okay. And then that needs to go in the scrap pile. This project's a little bit messy because we've got black everywhere. Now gently work it out of your mould. just gonna because it's all in pieces it sometimes decides that it wants to leave these edges you can easily get rid of those with your blade by just gently tapping against the edges okay and we just had a little nubbin over there that I had to get rid of okay 
this one is ready for the oven. Pick that up and I'll go bake that at Primo's recommended temperature for a full hour. And I'm going to make some more cabochons now. Okay, so here are the pendants now that they are out of the oven. And so now what I want to do is I want to try and clean them up as much as I can before I start sanding. So I've got a wet wipe over here and I've also got 99% alcohol. And this option is entirely, um, this step is entirely optional to you. You don't have to do it. So I'll just spray a bit of alcohol. And I'm going to start rubbing. And you can see that there's some paint coming off there. And I'll just do this with these a little bit because it just gets rid of quite a bit of the paint and it saves my sanding papers which um, get clogged up quite easily and I don't really want that so I like to clean off any stuff that I can before I actually start sanding. And this stuff comes off pretty easily. It's not going to clean it white white or anything like that. It's just going to get rid of quite a bit of that surface paint. And then I'll be able to bring in my sandpaper to clean it for the most part. Alright, so that one's okay. I'm now going to sand it. Okay, and I'm going to start with my lowest grit on my polishing papers which is a 400 and as soon as you start sanding you can see that that starts clearing up but it also does clog up these papers quite a bit so it's nice to um, clean it off a bit beforehand I'm just going to start on the edge you can see how nice and clean it's starting to look and then I'll start up here Oh, I love this part of it. It really is quite exciting to see what it's going to look like. It's going to look even better later when we actually um, seal in all the stuff with some liquid clay. So I'm just giving it a good sand to get rid of all those little bits and pieces. You don't want this grimy and you can see it does clog up the papers a bit so that's why I like to clean it beforehand if you're using wet dry sandpaper um, that one won't clog up as much especially if you're sanding underwater but that makes it very hard for me to actually capture that on camera so I like to use these on camera and I also like to use these as well because um, they're not as coarse and so you don't have to sand through so many grits and you get a higher polish with them. Now don't forget to do the edges and the back because um, the back also will have a nice pattern. So I'm just going to pop that down and sand like this to kill for most of it and we'll just have a few areas left. And then once I've finished sanding with the 400, which is the part that will take the most time because we're busy sanding off stuff purposefully, then I'll go up through all of my grits up to the 8000, which will give us a nice polish. And then depending on how shiny it is, how shiny I can get it, I might or might not use liquid clay to finish it up. So I'll show you what that looks like when I'm done. Okay, so here they are now that I have sanded them and they look really nice. I'm really happy with how the patterns come out and each one is completely different. So here you can see that it has a light sheen to it and here's the back. I'm not worrying too much about sanding the back because I've decided that these are going to become cabochons because they have a nice flat back so I'll probably use them in a project at some point and then I will just keep the backs the way they are. So I haven't really bothered too much with the backs. I've sanded them a little bit to get rid of a lot of the grime. But 
I've just focused on the fronts. So now I am going to buff them and I'm going to be using my Dremel tool. You can see what Dremel tool it is and I'm also going to be using my buffing wheel. You can see I've been using it a while and so it's started to fluff up like this which is really nice because um, it buffs really well. The nice thing about the Dremel is that you can decide your speed over here which I set onto a 2 generally and so it doesn't um, spin as fast as some of the other rotary tools you can get. So I highly recommend the Dremel. And we're going to be using Renaissance Wax but I want to buff this first. So I'm going to switch it on. You might want to turn your um, sound down a bit because this does make a bit of noise. you can see it there's quite a difference there now compared to this one so if you look at this one it's got a light sheen but this one's got a really nice shine to it so I've decided I'm not going to be doing liquid clay on these I'm going to keep them natural like this because the nice thing about doing it in pebble form like this you're going to get some of the natural cracks and things that you get in the stone so I don't want to cover that up with liquid clay so I'm just going to bring over an old wet wipe and I'm going to use this to brush on some Renaissance wax. There we are. And I don't have to do that too accurately because the Dremel wheel will take care of that. Again, turn down your sound. There we are, all done. So you can see what a beautiful natural shine that has. And it's really nice, I'm quite happy with that. And you can see it, it does have some cracks in it, which I like because it just adds to that natural feeling. So I'm going to go and do the other ones. So you can see, oops, completely different. I'm gonna go and buff these ones up and then you'll be able to see what they all look like. Okay, so there they are. Now, if you want to buy the buffing wheel that I was using, you can find that on my shop, Jessima Design, and I'll provide a link to that in the links below. So, that is basically it for all of these cabochons. Now, before you actually go and use them, um, you'll want to wait at least 10 minutes for the wax to dry if you did choose to use Renaissance wax. But as you can see, they look really nice now. So, Renaissance wax can be baked again. If you're going to use some sort of a uh, coating like liquid clay, you want to make sure that it, it can be um, baked again. So, something like UV resin I wouldn't recommend because you can't bake it again. Um, I would recommend liquid clay, Renaissance wax and Verithane. Both of all of those you can heat in the oven and so you can reuse these cabochons in projects which is important because we're basically just making them for projects so 
I'll see if I uh, want to use these in a project. I'm debating on whether I should make a pendant or a bracelet because you could set that in a bracelet which would look quite nice but I'll have to see. So I do hope that that tutorial was interesting to you and that you learned a few things. You can apply this technique to create faux white howlite as well and I will be doing a tutorial on that as well at some point so let me know in the comments if you would like to learn how to create white howlite and if you would like to create that knit jasper that I was talking about earlier. It's a little bit different, it's a little bit different colours and a little bit of a different pattern but it's basically um, the same stone as this. So let me know about that and I'll get on those tutorials as soon as I can. And please let me know what you thought of this tutorial. It was a lot of fun showing you how to make this and I'll be showing more faux stones in the future. So please let me know about that. And if you would like to support me, I do have a Patreon account. Um, I'll provide a link to that in the links below. And if you would like to purchase some of my tools, tutorials, or supplies, I do have a whole bunch of stuff on my Etsy shop dressing my design, ranging from cutters, texture stamps, uh, to tutorials and cogs and opal flex. So you can go and check that out. And as always, I'll see you in the next tutorial. Bye for now.